Hey y'all, welcome back or welcome if you are new. I'm Danny, and this is Homemaking Ain't Easy. So I told you all last week, I can't remember if I said it on Instagram or on YouTube, but I want to start trying to pump out two videos a week. You guys know that I do the extra video um, on Thursday, which is today or not today, but you'll be seeing it today. Um, on Thursday and um, so I really want to make those when we get into like gardening season which is like right around the corner it will likely be garden videos but it might occasionally be a coffee chat or whatever so I have um, mentioned to you all about my daughter's health um, a few times so we are going to have a coffee chat I made mine this is a peanut butter chocolate iced coffee um melissa who follows me she has a coffee channel and i saw her make something similar i didn't have all the ingredients like she did but um, i saw her make something similar to this and um i've been hooked on it since i made it the first day like i can't not drink it so um it's nice having somebody to get coffee recipes from that has um you know that are coffee recipes that feels like i'm getting something like starbucks you know style so anyways her name's melissa cooper 35 it's melissa underscore cooper 35 on instagram anyways so my daughter um I guess we'll just get into it. I have like some notes I'm going to look down at because I just wanted to cover a couple of things like going into it to kind of show you like our journey throughout. Um, but let's just get started. So we're going to start with the birth story aspect because it kind of all, it's kind of like a step um, to get to what you say. Like, yeah. do you think we need to start with the birth story? That's fine. Okay. So it's kind of like we started at one place and ended up to where we're at now. So the pregnancy, I would say, was a pretty normal pregnancy. Yeah. Um, I didn't have a ton of like morning sickness. It was my first pregnancy. Um, you know, we have our bonus son, but um, it was my first pregnancy. And so I didn't have a ton of morning sickness. I was like sick, but I didn't get sick, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um we some allergies yeah i have lots of allergies which i think is actually like part of a i think that's part of like actual pregnancy which is really weird like you wouldn't think that it would cause allergies but that's part of pregnancy like symptoms um i wouldn't know i know well i mean it's just weird because you wouldn't think that like allergies was part of like a pregnancy symptom that's not something that you would think but i have a really close friend of mine who's pregnant right now and she's like my nose and i'm like i know girl i know um you know who you are but anyways so uh but um you know a normal pregnancy we did get pregnant um we she is a pandemic baby technically but we got pregnant before COVID even started like we had planned to have her started trying before the new year of 2019 and then we were blessed like we got pregnant really quickly which i know that's not everybody's case and if that's not your case i'm very sorry that you struggle with that i could not imagine i've had so many friends who struggled with getting pregnant or pregnancy loss and so i personally like i couldn't believe it was real when i got pregnant and every step of the way i was like just so thankful and blessed and knew how like how what is the word vulnerable every pregnancy is essentially you know i've heard of people losing babies right up until like the baby was born so mm -hmm. that was something i was very aware of and very afraid of already but you know the pregnancy by all means was extremely normal um all the you know the ultrasounds came back normal i did have uh right before i got pregnant i had some hives that popped up and like would not go away so i was on stuff like allergy medication and um stomach medicine but they were all things that were safe during pregnancy but anyways so safe pregnancy i ended up in the last couple of weeks of pregnancy having high blood pressure and so 
the doctor, I had had high blood pressure Monday. He was like, come in Tuesday. And if your blood pressure is still high, we're just going to induce you. And so came in Tuesday. He was like, you were supposed to like follow instructions and you didn't. He was joking. He was a really great doctor. And um, they put us in the hospital to induce us. Um, I was like not dilated at all. So they did a couple procedures to try to get me dilated. That didn't work. They finally started inducing me. Like we checked into the hospital around four o'clock the day before she was born. That morning about four o'clock AM, they gave me um, the medicine to induce us. And then he came in about nine to um, break my water. And then after that, it was like pretty fast going. Um, one of my closest friends told me that her daughter used the peanut ball, like it's a peanut yoga, yoga ball. And, um, we use that and it literally, I dilated so quickly that it was just like, boom, like at one point I was like one. And then in an hour, I would say like an hour to an hour and a half, I was like at she was like, you're ready to have this baby now. <laughs> and so had her, she came out screaming. Um, and I noticed very quickly that the top of her scalp looked different. Now I got her out in just a couple of pushes. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I knew he didn't use any forceps or anything like that. So I looked at the top of her scalp and I was like, well, maybe it's just misshapen from going through the birth canal. Well, I looked at my doctor and then the doctor looked at the nurses like it was him, a medical student, and two nurses in there. And everybody was kind of like looking around at each other. And I know that they were just trying to like not freak me out at all. But of course, as a new mom, I was like, like I was snuggling her by that point. And I was like, what is that? And my doctor was like, I've never seen it before. And now this man, he was an amazing doctor. He's birthed a lot of babies. So when I heard him say he had not seen it before, I was slightly concerned. Um, and then, but like they weren't high, like they weren't overly concerned. So they let me snuggle with her for a few minutes. She was still upset. She was still crying pretty heavy. And then they were like, okay, we're going to take her to the pediatrician, have the pediatrician come take her out. So they did that. Um, and then the next thing you know, the pediatrician comes in and talks to me and he's like, okay, I've been in chats, you know, it had been like a minute. I had been planning like my whole pregnancy to have Chick-fil-A delivered to the hospital. You know, I was like so excited about that post-pregnancy meal because they actually did not have me eat anything after 12 o'clock the night before for birthing. And so I was so excited. Like I had already ordered the Chick-fil-A. We were just, she was just getting checked up in the nursery and the pediatrician came in and he's like, I'm a little concerned. And I'm like, well, I am too. Cause at that point I knew she had been gone for a while. I knew what I had seen and that I didn't get that normal time that you would get with an infant when they're first born. I understood that because obviously there was something that we didn't know what was going on, but I was still concerned. He explained that he had sent a picture to somebody that he knew at our local children's hospital. It was about an hour and a half away from where we were at, but it was our local children's hospital. And he explained that he sent the picture to them. They were like, yeah, we think you need to go ahead and send this baby on. So basically he was like, we're sending your baby to children's. And I was like, wow. Oh my goodness. You yeah. know? Yeah. And in our mind, you know, I think as a new mom, when you watch, like I watched a ton of YouTubers and like all that. And in my mind, I was just like, I'm going to snuggle up during this postpartum period. I had prepared um, mentally and emotionally for the postpartum season. And I was like ready to snuggle up with her. It was right around, she's born October 22nd. So I was like, we're going to watch scary movies or I am, and I'm just going to snuggle her and all that stuff. Well, um, the next thing we're going to the hospital. Well, thankfully my doctor came in and said, you had a normal birth. It's okay. I, I was medicated. I was for sure medicated. I'm not going to front. I wanted to do natural. I do not know how people do it. I was medicated. But he said, as soon as your um, epidural wears off, you can go. So he had already started the paperwork for me to be able to check out. So um, they take me. I'm like, I just want to see my baby. So they take me to the nursery. She's Her head's wrapped up from where she had like what looked like a little scar or, or like a little sore on the top of her head. And she had IVs. It was like very traumatizing, stressful, just as like a new mom, you know, all the emotions that you have coming out, you're just like, 
whoa. So, um, I go back, or they say East Tennessee, or East Tennessee Children's Hospital is here to get her, so they come. Mm -hmm. um, we go back to my room. I'm signing all the paperwork I need to to get checked out. He's packing our stuff up like we're ready to go as soon as she goes. And um, they come in, get her all packed up. They let me see her. I loved that so much. They brought her to see me before she left. And so that meant so much to me. So she leaves soon after. I had her at 1.30. She leaves about 5, 4, 35, mm -hmm. and we check out immediately after. And then um, we go home, pack a quick bag. Obviously, we had no idea, like, if this was going to be a short thing. At the time, we thought it was just whatever was going on in her head. And so we go home, get a bag of stuff, and head out to the children's hospital, which, again, was an hour and some change away. Um, I basically took my hospital bag that I already had packed and a couple extra things. So we get there. It's kind of like a slow night. She's in obviously like one of those NICU things that you see often, unfortunately. And, you know, she's hooked up to all these things and she's crying and doing normal things. But um, we were just in the room. The nurse was there and she was like super sweet. They gave me a pump because I wanted to be able to breastfeed. And so... Um, we just, she was like rest, but of course, like my mama instincts are kicking in. So every time she cried, I would get up and stand up. And I remember that nurse telling me, you need to rest. Like you need to sit down, you need to rest. And we got up, I think it was like three o'clock in the morning. He was such a good trooper. Like he went with me cause I was like, I'm hungry. I hadn't eaten anything like that Chick-fil-A, forget about it. We didn't eat it. Like it was, we were so sick to our stomach about everything. We didn't eat it. So the next day, fast forward, um, you know, we had a ton of people come talk to us, as you do when you have a child in the hospital. They had scheduled, she had had a little bit of a murmur. I left that out. At the other hospital, she had a murmur. Um, and I know that that's normal for babies, but because of the murmur plus her scalp situation, they were not comfortable. And I was really appreciative. That's actually why they sent us to children. They didn't like the scalp part, but the scalp plus the murmur actually was like, okay, let's go. So anyways, they gave her a uh, echocardiogram the next morning. And I remember looking at the screen, obviously I knew I did not know how to read all the things that were going on, but I looked at the screen and I saw rainbow. Now I'm no expert, but I know that you're supposed to have on those things, you know, red means blood coming in, blue means oxygenated blood going out. And when I saw rainbow, my heart dropped because I was like, something is not right. And I knew it immediately. So we see that obviously the, the person who was doing the echocardiogram can say nothing until it's reviewed by a doctor. So we go take a walk because I was like, Landon, I, I don't think this is a good situation. And so we go take a walk and then they, they call us back or we go back and then, um, he, the gentleman sits us down and is like, I'm so sorry that you're going through this. Like you thought you were going to have a healthy daughter and she is not, she's actually a very, what was the words that he used? Well, he said, um, I know you expected to have a happy, healthy daughter that you could take home right away. He said, but we, what you've actually had is a very, very sick baby. Um, her heart is not normal. Yeah. Um, and that's what they were really worried about. At that uh, point. Yeah, the, the head was a, just a precursor to make everybody go, wait, something's different here. Yeah. And then the murmur they had discovered. But honestly, the murmur would have not been enough by itself to send her to, to, send her to children's. Yeah. Because, you know, normally they send they send children home with murmurs sometimes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, you know, she her heart wasn't, wasn't good at all. Yeah. So he says, um, the cardiologist is going to come talk to you guys and kind of explain it. So our cardiologist took us into a separate room and kind of like drew on immediately. She had to have pick lines placed because she needed to get oxygen that she would not have been able to get and medicines that she would not be able to get. Like they had to keep what's called her PDA open so that she could continue to get oxygen. That's something that normally closes after birth. 
but if hers had closed, she would not have been able to breathe. Yeah. So they started doing basically a surgery in her room immediately after they found out. So he takes us into another room because we couldn't be in there for that. And he kind of draws her heart for us. So at the time, the diagnosis was Tetralogy of Fallot, which is basically, Sean White actually has that, the, the famous snowboarder. Um, but it's a combination of four different heart defects. So um, he showed us what was going on and explained to us. And we were like, well, you know what? Like, we really just wanted somebody to say, I think, like, she's going to be okay. Right. But at that point, nobody was comfortable saying that because number one, heart conditions are different for each person. Mm -hmm. Each heart is so individual. And second of all, she also had the scalp thing still going on. Now, we had been seen by neurology that morning and she was fine with sending us home that day. They actually, the neurologist there and somebody else actually got in an argument because the gentleman was like, she needs to go to Vanderbilt. And the neurologist was really wanting to keep her there. And I'm thankful that he was like, no, because he knew what we needed. And he was fighting. He was advocating for our daughter without us really knowing that we needed to advocate. But he was like, this is not a, a discussion. And I was really happy with that. But anyways, so they tell us she's going to Vanderbilt tonight, which is the a big children's hospital in Tennessee, the best. It's a teaching hospital. It's a teaching hospital, but it's like the best children's hospital in Tennessee. And so... You know, we were trying to get prepared for that. At the time, the Ronald McDonald house wasn't open because it's in the thick of COVID. Mm -hmm. um, there's visiting restrictions because of COVID. And so, and he had my bonus son back at home. So there was just so much going on. So I had to get on the phone. The social worker there at the hospital told us, your specific insurance actually gets hotel rooms for people who need them, which was a blessing because they had rooms at the hospital, but it was like a first come first serve basis. And like whoever lived the furthest away really got those. And so it was really kind of up in the air whether you would get one or not. Yeah, and there was a way to sleep in the room, but uh, it and, wasn't very comfortable. Yeah, in her first room, they actually didn't even have that couch. They only had a chair in her first room that she was at at Vanderbilt. But anyway, so I'm on the phone with insurance. It's like four o'clock in the afternoon when we got this news. I'm on the phone with insurance. They're, by the time I leave that hospital, they have, I get, I'm about to get emotional, but I'm trying not to because God blessed us every step of the way mm -hmm. in this situation. He alerted our pediatrician to say she needs to go to Vanderbilt he alerted them to do all the necessary procedures and alerted them to send her to Vanderbilt where she eventually went. And he allowed it to where we had the insurance that covered hotel stays. And it was just every step of the way, God's hand was in this. So anyways, um, by the time we left the hospital, which I think ended up being like five o'clock, he, they had us a hotel room. They, had me the information i knew that when i got to nashville that night i would be able to have a place to lay my head and not have to worry about out of pocket expenses for us mm -hmm. um so i called my sister her she was actually pregnant at the time her husband um and her actually I met them at my sister's home and they drove me to Nashville. Like my sister drove my car because at that point I was going off a of very little sleep, mm -hmm. extremely high emotions. They were like, you're not driving there by yourself. So we got in the car. Her I husband, was, I was exhausted. He was exhausted and he couldn't, you know, he had to stay with our bonus son. So, or with his son, but he had to stay with my bonus son. So there was no way he could go. And they, even if he had went, he would have only gotten to see her, like he would have only gotten to see me at night in the hotel room because right. yeah, couldn't he couldn't have her. went there. Um, so they drove me. I literally slept like I was trying so hard to talk to my sister, but I was, I just passed out in the car. It was like a three and a half hour trip and I just passed out in the car. And I felt so bad because it was like nighttime. Like we didn't get there until 12 o'clock. And, um, which there's actually a time change where we're at versus where Vanderbilt was. And so it was crazy. But anyways, um, we got there. I checked into the hotel room. I actually called. They allowed me to call to check in on her. The 
the ambulance was amazing that transported her there. They called me to let them know when they packed up, everything that was going on. They did have to, have to intubate her um, because the medicine that she was on could cause some, um, cause her to stop breathing in her sleep. And they didn't want to be intubating her over, she had like one instance, they didn't want to be doing that on the road. So they went ahead and did it. They were amazing. They called me every step of the way and told me everything. So I called at 12 when I got checked into the hotel checked on her they said she was doing amazing she was fine they had made it safe and then i passed out so then the next morning i woke up and i um i woke up went to the hospital first thing like took a bag of goodies and all that stuff i had pumped the night before and um because i was trying to get my milk to come in and then we went to the hospital the next morning um met my first vanderbilt nurse which was one of my favorites he was amazing um, they were all amazing really in the NICU and you know, they just kept me updated on her and everything else. It was a weekend. So it was a Saturday that she got there. So they do rounds because it's a teaching hospital. And so they did do an echo on her first thing Saturday morning um, to confirm the diagnosis that the children's hospital in East Tennessee had given us. Um, and he actually changed the diagnosis at that time um, to double outlet right ventricle. And so, I mean, it's, they can be the same thing. It's a big explanation I won't go into. But anyways, um, I didn't get, I was basically in limbo. Because if you know, anywhere on the weekend is basically limbo unless you're in an emergency situation, which the nurses and there was a doctor who was over our case, like in the NICU. And she was like, basically, it's a good thing that you're not having to call in the big wigs right now. Like, we're okay with it just being calm until Monday. And so everything was doing well. My milk came in. I was able to start feeding her. But in the meantime, they were giving her breast milk from the donation bank, which was nice. Um, so anyways, uh, we found out that there was a meeting once a week with all the doctors and they would decide what to do for her at that meeting, which was that coming Thursday or that coming Tuesday. So basically they decided that she needed um, a vulvoplasty to kind of open up uh, one of her arteries that was really, really small and to get some air flowing to her. So she had that on that Wednesday following her birth. So she was born on Thursday, that following Wednesday, she went into a deep surgery or like, it, it's not a deep surgery, but I had to fill out these papers. Like I was talking to him every day. I was calling him when the rounds were going on so he could kind of hear what was going on. So it wasn't just all on me to remember. And, um, but the papers I had to sign, and of course, like you've got less than a week old baby and you're having to sign these papers saying like, well, this could happen. And, you know, ultimately the risk of every surgery is, is death, unfortunately. So that was overwhelming. But anyways, she got that. Um, we talked to a ton of doctors and specialists about her head and everything else. Um, and we went about our way right after her surgery. She was doing well. She was eating well. Um, and so they moved us to the step down unit and we were actually, they were waiting for her PDA to close or we would have left earlier, but we were in the hospital for three weeks at that time. Um, they did check her because, uh, they noticed the scalp defects and the heart defects. They did say, well, there's something called Adams Oliver syndrome, which my doctor had actually looked up when he found out, like he called us the night that he found out we were going to Vanderbilt and he was like, this is what it could be. He's like, I have a good feeling that this is what it is. Yeah, he figured it out before they ever before they thought even it. thought of it. And mm -hmm. then when we got there, um, it was like the geneticist there was like, well, she doesn't have these noticeable abnormalities that go with the disease. So he didn't test for it. Well, we go home. I noticed something about her limbs. And so we make, um, she her doesn't fingers. have her two fingers right here. She looks normal all over, but her two fingers on this side of her hand don't have that top line right there. It's hard to explain. They're kind of pointy. They look different. It's something that only really only a mother or a father would notice. But anyways, um, so our, we get home, our pediatrician sends our information off to genetics and uh, we know when we get sent home from Vanderbilt that that surgery was just a temporary surgery and that she was going to have to have an open heart surgery at around six months of age, um, just so that her heart could be, basically what they do is they do the vulvoplasty to make sure that her heart is bigger and stronger when she goes in for the open heart surgery. Cause it wasn't necessary that she had it like at a couple days old, but it was necessary that when she got to six months old, she would need it. So, um, 
Well, the cardiologist said basically that her heart muscle is, is pumping hard. It's fine, but the plumbing is all wrong. Yeah, and that's what so the, yeah. That's the 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 balloon that they put in there was to open up one of the the PDA to keep allow No, not the PDA. Oh. Um the left pulmonary artery okay. or one of the pulmonary arteries. It was to open up I think it's a left pulmonary artery. Mm -hmm. But even then he was like the left pulmonary artery is a little small. You might have to put a stent in it later. We'll see how this goes. And thankfully they didn't have to do a stent. It worked really well. She was getting the oxygen. The PDA eventually closed and we were able to go home, but we knew that there was going to be a six uh, surgery around six months. So obviously we're going to regular, uh, to regular cardiologist appointments. She did well. Um, she made it up until six months. They actually kept on putting off her surgery mm -hmm. um, until she was about seven months because she was doing so well. We had a piece of hospital equipment that came home with us just to check her oxygen saturations. I had to do that um, a couple times every day just to make sure she was getting enough oxygen. So uh, April of 2021, she goes in for open heart surgery. It was like the most nerve wracking thing, but they made it so easy there. Like we went for pre-op a couple days before. Um, and while I told you it was scary when they had me signing papers, um, for her vulvoplasty, like saying like this could end in death and all that other stuff, her heart surgeon, he knew how vulnerable we were, I think. And he never, he said, you know what the risk is. And he, he did it by the book like he was supposed to, but he was very kind not to mention certain words that he knew would be triggers for yeah, us. Yeah, he, he was like, he was like. I believe that we can get this done. It's pretty routine, actually, for for babies to have this heart surgery. I've done it a lot. I'm very, uh, very experienced at doing it. Now, you know the risk. But I feel like that, you yeah. know, you know it's a, he, he kind of skipped over the bad part and was just trying I mean, he to told us, us that he was, he was yeah. good at what he does. Yeah. He was. Well, he told us the bad part, but in a way that wasn't, like, so jaw-dropping, I think, you know. Um, so anyways, he did that. Um, the next morning, you know, she went in for the surgery. And while I had been so stressed out the whole six months previous to that, I actually, we talked about how it was weird that we actually had a sense of peace mm -hmm. about it. Because number one, you know that she has to have a heart surgery. There's no option other than. And number two, it's like, you just have to have, like, we knew that God had been with us through this whole thing. We knew that he would be with us through this whole thing. So yeah. I think we just had a sense of peace. We prayed very hard. We fasted. We did all the things. And we just had a sense of peace when we handed her over. Um, so she had her surgery, got out, um, did really well, and got to go home after a week. And um, she had some stomach problems later that was just from the surgery and her stomach needing to get back to normal after the surgery, after, you know, they basically just, like stop your whole body, you know? And so, um, but we were super blessed because I know we met some people while we were there um, who had been there for months and they were so extremely strong and been through so much. So I was like so thankful that we got to go home after a week, although I was mentally prepared like we had mentally prepared ourselves like we don't know what this is going to look like we could have to stay and either way would have been fine because at the end of the day i just wanted to go home with a baby that i knew i was confident was okay um and so fast forward from april to september we go to the geneticist and he's like well we're going to test for adams oliver syndrome and a couple weeks later in september she had a confirmed diagnosis of adams oliver syndrome so Adam's Oliver syndrome, it is a super rare condition. Um, and I just wrote down a couple of notes because like these are things, I didn't know like the specific statistics, but I just wanted to have specific statistics for you guys. <coughs> so it affects males and females the same and occurs in 44 out of every 10 million people. Um, rare. So it's super rare. I mean, it's not the rarest of things I've heard of, but it's mm -hmm. super rare. You know, like really, it's under the rare disease. Like when you look it up, it's under rare diseases. Um, so the aplasia cutis congenita was what was wrong with her scalp. It's where like the skin doesn't grow in on top of the scalp. And then um, the heart condition is present in about 23% of the people with Adams-Oliver syndrome. 
Um, also, she, like a lot of people with Adam's Oliver syndrome have, syndrome has issues with like limbs, like they're missing mm -hmm. toes or legs or arms and- Or one foot is larger than the other. Right. Or, you know. There's a lot of, of abnormalities with that. And so the only abnormality that we have seen so far is her fingers and you know she works with them well and all that stuff so you wouldn't notice unless yeah unless you really looked at it it's nothing that we think is like life like is like debilitating or could be debilitating no. um but basically she has something called notch one adams oliver so because it's such a rare condition they only have experiences with like so many people so there are certain types hers is specifically notch one which tends to go heavy on the heart conditions and less heavy on the limb normality mm -hmm. abnormalities and everything else so um you know i consider even though she has a rare disease i consider her to be blessed to not have the serious abnormalities um but uh basically when they found out what type she had they sent us to a ton of specialists because they know what is expected with these types of Adams Oliver syndrome. Mm -hmm. So there is an eye condition um, that is possible with notch one. It's like in, I think it was like 10% of the people or maybe even less, but that's something that they knew. Um, she does have what they call mottled skin. So her, um, when she gets really upset, you can see her blood vessels under her skin a little bit more than normal. Um, and then it's like a blotchy pattern. It's like a blotchy pattern. It, like they call it modeling. Um, but, um, and of course she goes to, uh, the cardiologist. And then when we first left Vanderbilt, she went to plastics. Um, but as of now where we're at, she's a little over two years. She's almost two and a half years, which is crazy. Mm -hmm. Cause I feel like we just had her birthday. She does go to the eye doctor twice a year until she can speak to us. Like the eye doctor is all, but like, 10% sure that she doesn't have that eye condition, but the only way to fully know is to test the pressures coming out of her eye vessels, like the vessels in her eyes. And so he was like, we can put her under for that, but I don't want her, she's already yeah. been through a lot. And if he's all but 10% sure, she can talk to us um, and we can know if there's something bad going on with her eye and get her to the hospital immediately because we know what the possibility could be. Um, so she goes to a regular eye doctor here, once a year and then she goes to a retina specialist once a year so basically she's going to the eye doctor every six months just to make sure that we can catch anything if anything does happen she goes to obviously her regular doctor's appointments because she needs all of her regular stuff and then um cardiologist we saw november of last year we won't go back until um i think it's like september of this year and if she does well at that one it will be another year um genetics released us until she's seven years old and plastics released us until she's about seven six or seven both of them are school age mm -hmm. um yeah so if you see her in the videos you'll you may notice that she has really thin hair on mm -hmm. the very very top of her head kind, yeah. of, kind of in the back mm -hmm. and that's where the her scalp grew in but it's kind of kind of scarred so that the hair has a has a little trouble growing in that spot, but mm -hmm. um, as far as cases that I've seen of Adams Oliver with people with their scalp, um, she's doing really well with that. So yeah, uh, she's got Adams Oliver syndrome, but God has definitely blessed us in the fact that every one of the things that would be really wrong is not really wrong, except or like for, could be, except for the heart. Yeah, you know her that heart was scary. Her heart was really messed up. Um, you know the guy. The cardiologist told us that um, we have a very sick baby. Well, that wasn't so. the cardiologist. That was the guy over the NICU. Oh, okay. Well, it all blended together. Oh, but yeah, that's blurred for me. Right? That kind Honestly. of that kind of was the hardest part. I think we took that, which I think he just was trying to be realistic with us. I think yeah. he wanted us to know the seriousness because we were kind of like in a blur. I think he just really wanted us to know the seriousness so that we were prepared. Um, but it also stuck with us so much that we were like terrified until her first surgery, until she had her open heart surgery. So right. basically where she is now, um, she will eventually have to have a second surgery. Um, her first open heart surgery was what they call a valve sparing and they couldn't spare her pulmonary valve. So they will have to go in and put in an artificial one. 
And the goal is to try to make it until she's an adolescent because her heart will be bigger and um, she won't have to get it replaced at like as close together. But for example, if, if she were to need one no. next year, she would need another one in a couple of years as her heart grows bigger because um, the valves obviously can't grow with them. So our goal is to try to make it as far as we can without them um, and you know, see, but I know the signs that we have to look for when it comes to when she'll need that heart valve. Um, her original open heart doctor said he feels like it will be a really long time and he feels like by the time she will need it, it will be a less invasive surgery. So it won't be an open heart surgery because in some hospitals, they're actually doing heart valves through cath like through cath lab. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, who knows what the future holds for her. her um, I will never like be at ease. Her heart will never be quote unquote fixed because that's just not, you know, she will always have a congenital heart defect. Like that will never change. And so um, it's a reality that we live with, but we're extremely blessed that she's not on medications anymore. She is, a, she, to look at her, you would not know that she had this rare disease. You would not know that she had a heart surgery mm -hmm. at six months. You would not know any of that stuff. Um, when she does turn around six or seven, the um, plastics, uh, our plastics doctor will look at her scalp and see if she needs something called a skin expansion. Um, because obviously with that part of her head exposed, she would be at risk for skin cancer if we don't do some kind of something to cover it. So a skin expansion surgery would require them to do a surgery on her head and, you know, put balloons underneath and stretch the skin out and then it would actually grow in her natural hair. Right. But they wait long enough because you just don't know what's going to happen. Her natural hair might cover it up. Her natural hair might grow in. So it's really just a waiting game to see. So far it's covered up quite a bit, but you know, we'll see when she gets to that age. And then genetics, I think it's just one of those things that like it, you look for everything that you can and all the possibilities that you can, but you know, there's really not, not much a geneticist can do. I did get tested. I was negative for the Adams Oliver trait or gene because you can have Adams Oliver's like you can have, you can carry the gene and not have any symptoms or you can have it and not have any symptoms. So I tested negative. We haven't gotten him tested yet. Um, it either came from my side or it, uh, it was a random, what they call random mutation. Yeah. Which honestly, we probably should get you tested anyways, just for Trevin's sake to see if we need to get him tested, but mm -hmm. we'll see my bonus son. Like we'll see if it, what we might get him tested just to make sure that my bonus son doesn't have the possibility of passing it down. But anyways, um, so that is my daughter's health situation. I wasn't going to, like, I was kind of protective because she's two and she can't say, hey, I want people to know this about me or I don't. However, I do think that it's important to bring awareness to rare diseases. Um, you guys see her occasionally, not very much, and you probably won't see her a ton, but um, I wanted you guys to know when I talk about her health issues or mention them, what I'm speaking of. Um, we probably won't talk about it often because her health issues don't define who she is as a toddler, who she is as a person. It's something that she deals with, but it's not something that I feel like makes her who she is. I want her to be able to be identified like without that. And so, you know, um, we're not ashamed of it and we know we are very blessed. But we also want to, like, let her be her without that defining her, so. Well, I'll tell you, we, um, it was very traumatizing at first. But as I've noticed, as time goes on these days, we talk about it less and less and less. Yeah. Because it's just, it's not, it, you know, front and center in your mind. Until, yeah. until the day that she needs her surgery, and then uh, it'll be front and center again. But then yeah. after that, it, it'll probably be less and less and less. And Yeah, and one thing is... Um, because she has Adam's Oliver syndrome, she has a 50% chance of passing it on to her kids. Yeah, so, so we'll have to explain to her when she gets older uh, and when she starts talking about having children or getting married or all that stuff that, hey, you know, there is a possibility that your children could go through the same thing. Yeah. But so, at least we'll be prepared this time. Yeah, she'll be prepared this time, um, you know. But honestly, I wouldn't change not knowing through my pregnancy because I think I would have been a nervous wreck. 
and I prefer like going through my pregnancy being okay yeah um because I think I would have just worried myself to pieces if I knew what we were it would have been nice because we would have already been at Vanderbilt we would have already been like mentally prepared and we yeah. would have known so it wouldn't have been as much traveling and as much shock but at the same time like I wouldn't have wanted to go through my whole pregnancy or half of my pregnancy yeah. knowing it For like months that would have been horrible in my opinion so thank you for listening this is a lot to open our hearts i don't think we've actually had an in-depth conversation with anybody besides close family about yeah. this so um know that it is special for us to share this if you've dealt with a rare disease or a serious disease our hearts goes out to you if you've dealt with um loss like of any kind our heart goes out to you and just it's important to have these conversations so people don't feel so isolated um, or closed off and they're able to talk about it. So I always say this, you know, if you like coffee chats, let's focus on that because obviously nothing in this video is fun to talk about. <laughs> um, you know, it was traumatic at several steps of the way, but if you like coffee chats, if you like my videos, if you like seeing a glimpse into my life and my family, please hit the like button, hit the bell, subscribe and until next time, homemaking ain't easy. Let's be for real.